Well, hello, my village family. It's good to be with you guys. Wish I was there in person. I kind of had a fly through Atlanta this week and Ray and I had been talking about the series that you guys are in right now, a new look at some old stories, which is right up my alley. And specifically where Ray has found himself in the patriarchs, I believe last week, well, I, I know last week I watched the sermon was about Jacob and it was absolutely wonderful. It was so wonderful that I called to uh, talk to Ray about the sermon and the service. And as we were talking about it, just in the course of our conversation, our love for these old stories and our love for this specific location of the patriarchs became so apparent because we just started preaching to one another on the phone. Uh, not preaching at one another, but preaching with one another. And before too long, we were crying and talking and just remembering again. I mean, the point of this series, these stories, some of them thousands of years old, are still so incredibly relevant. It really recaptures for me just the beauty that really is sacred literature and specifically here the Bible. You know something that is classic, you know something is sacred in its form when it transcends time and it transcends culture. And that's exactly what the Bible does for me. You guys know our location here within the Christian church. Uh, we are part of a movement that is really calling on Christianity to grow up and mature. We believe deeply in the roots of Christianity, but we think Christianity has to continue to evolve. By its very nature, we believe Christianity is evolutionary and maturing. And one of the things uh, that I say quite often in this maturation, and it's not a maturation that we're the only ones calling for, this is something that's been developing I think since the beginning of Christianity, but especially writ large for the last couple of hundred years. But one of the things that I frequently say is, you know, the way we treat Scripture is so critically important. If we continue to look at Scripture as the constitution of a salvific religion, a religion that is only focused on the afterlife and this bifurcated judgment where most people burn forever and a few people get to go to this you know, a heavenly home with streets of gold. If we continue to look at Scripture narrowly through that lens, I think we're really shooting ourselves in the foot and really selling short what Jesus came to do, um, what is really at play here, and the undercurrent of true Christianity, the true Judeo-Christian movement. I think as Christianity matures, we're going to realize that, uh, that we are more than a salvific religion we are a wisdom tradition, a wisdom tradition that doesn't simply tell the story, the historical account of people 2,000, 3,000 years ago, but our wisdom tradition tells stories, however rooted they are in history, that even more importantly are rooted in the soul of every human being. These stories are our stories. And when you begin reading scripture that way, you really begin, you really begin experiencing the fullness of I think the power of Scripture. So when we read stories about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, of course we're reading the stories of people who lived long ago. But the reason we're still reading those stories is because they're our stories. And as we're reading them, that's what happened to Ray and I last week as we were recounting Jacob and then the story of his son Joseph that I'm about to share just a small portion of here in a moment. When we're reading those stories, we're like, that's me. Those players are are all of us. Um, we we find ourselves in the stories, and they speak so germane to what we're currently going through. No story does that for me more than the story of Jacob, and specifically his son Joseph. You guys know what I do. I deal with a lot of people who have been hurt in a lot of ways. Specifically, I mean, there's it's no secret. I, I spend a lot of my life work with queer people, LGBTQ people, whose hurt specifically is rooted in one of the most painful areas, uh, that of church and family, the two areas that were supposed to be the most loving for them, and in ways have been the most loving, have also, in a, in a grand paradox of suffering, turned out to be their greatest hurt. And, and as I deal with them, forgiveness is something that comes up a lot. And I used to know exactly how I felt about forgiveness and how all of that worked. The longer I live, the more I realize that it's a complex matter and one that has to form fit by God's spirit to every life and to every situation and to cookie cut it and say forgiveness is three steps. And it's, you know, I, I know we shouldn't overcomplicate everything, 
But I think we also shouldn't oversimplify complex, uh, stratified matters. And I think forgiveness is one of those. So I'm always listening and I'm always trying to adapt my thoughts, my heart to the specific situation that I'm hearing. Because again and again and again, day after day, I hear stories and I think, well, I think I've heard it all. And then here comes another story, another layer of hurt, another angle of pain that I've, I've never considered before. And so as I try to minister to these folks and minister to my own issues around forgiveness, not only as one who needs to forgive, but as one who needs to be forgiven. Um, as I do that, I'm always looking for material. And I just want to say, before I read this small text from the life of Joseph, Jacob's son, the patriarch, no story, no tool in my tool belt has been more helpful for me, both personally and vocationally, than this story. To remind you a little of the story, Joseph was one of Jacob's 12 sons. Ray did a marvelous message last week on Jacob, and when I called to talk to him about it, one of the first things I said was, it's interesting to me that in Genesis 37, if you look at the old King James, I love the poetic way it says it, and I think there are implications here. The old King James says, now this is the story of Jacob, Joseph being 17 years old. Central to the story of Jacob, even in its literary regurgitation, the telling of the story, Joseph is there from the beginning. Now this is the story of Jacob, Joseph being 17 years old. The man had 12 sons and many daughters, in a patriarchal society, daughters didn't get quite as much mentioned, but there were a lot of children. And somehow the text understands that no one was more central to the story of Jacob than his son, Joseph. Joseph was the son of Jacob's beloved wife, Rachel. After having 10 children in that polygamous culture with her older sister, Leah, Rachel finally gave birth to the much longed for child. And that child's name was Joseph. Another son was born later to Rachel and Jacob, and that son's name was Benjamin. And these boys play a significant role in what I'm about to share here. But Joseph was this highly favored son. It was obvious to all of the other children that Joseph was the favorite. And, and those of you that have been raised in the church, you might remember the story of how Joseph was so favored that his father did things like he made for him and gave him this exclusive coat of many colors. Without going into all of the background historically of that, suffice to say that giving, that present, that coat made it very clear to all of the children that Joseph was the favored one. And this spoiled 17-year-old boy one day went out from his father to find his other brothers who were tending the sheep in the field. And upon finding them and being with them, the story goes that Joseph told his brothers some dreams that he had been having. And those dreams were very easily interpreted to mean that one day Joseph was going to rise to a position of primacy and his brothers would be subject to him whether that was king, governor of the land, whatever, it, owner of the plantation, whatever it meant, it was very clear in the telling of these dreams that Joseph was telling, Joseph had had, that his brothers were going to be subject to him. They were going to be subjugated by him and they would be his servants. Well, that's an interesting part of the story because Joseph was only 17 when he had those dreams. He was 17 when he told his brothers those dreams and his telling the brothers, the dreams, really indicates clearly this is a guy who was very spiritually gifted, but he wasn't very spiritually mature. And it's a good reminder that that we can have a lot of gifts, but if we don't have the suspension and the handling and the shock absorbers and the braking systems to handle the horsepower of those gifts, we can do a lot of silly things. And this was one of those things, as the Spirit said to Mary that later about Jesus and her impregnation, really Joseph should have pondered these things in his heart because Joseph didn't realize not everybody is as happy about your dreams as you are. And especially those that may not have as big a dreams as you have and as profitable a dreams as you have to tell them your dreams, you have to be very careful. So Joseph was incredibly spiritually gifted, but he had very little spiritual discretion. 
Long story short, his brothers became so upset that they decided, and, and this is where the story really turns dark, they decided to kill him. Fratricide, the, the murder of a brother. The Bible says that in the process of figuring out how they were going to do that, they bound Joseph and they put him in an abandoned well. Can you imagine? Bound by his brothers, the people he believed loved him most, jealously bound and lowered down into this dark, dank pit. The Bible said Joseph had to sit at the bottom of that well in shock listening to his brothers formulate how they can get away with his murder. It's a horrible story. Well, fortunately for Joseph, one of the older brothers, Reuben, stepped in, had a moment of clarity, and thwarted his brother's plans. He told the brothers, there's no use. We shouldn't kill him. I mean, we could at least get some money because I, I know Midianite slave traders are going to be passing through here shortly. And you know, let's not waste a commodity here. The Bible says parenthetically that Reuben actually didn't want to kill Joseph, and he was only doing this to throw the brothers off of their plan, and later, instead of selling Joseph to the slave traders as he said they could, he would come back and deliver Joseph. Well, the plan partially worked. The brothers backed off and said, we might as well get something for him. As a matter of fact, here come the slave traders now, and they pulled Joseph up out of the well. And this poor kid, bound and tethered, had to go into a cart with other people who had been purchased along the way. And he rolled off in that cart, looking back through its bars to a set of brothers who had just commoditized him in the most horrible way and sold him into slavery. Bible says that his brothers went home when the father asked them where was their younger brother, this beloved son of his, when Jacob asked. They took that coat of many colors, a coat that they had shredded and dipped in animal's blood, and they told their father a lie. They told the old man Jacob that his son had died after being attacked by animals. Jacob, believing the story, wept, desiring almost to die. He held that tattered garment close to him and he grieved his son and his life was never the same again. As Emily Dickinson said, the wound grew so large to his whole life fell in it. Now this is the story of Jacob, Joseph being 17 years old. Now this is the story of Jacob, Joseph having died, at least in his mind. This is a great story of how how something can become reality to us that really isn't true. But if we believe it to be true, the emotion and the impact is the same. For Jacob, Joseph was dead. What an evil scheme the brothers had plotted. The story goes on, and you could take 10 messages to tell this story, but the story goes on that Joseph is enslaved, and even in his slavery, he's mistreated. Accused improperly, ultimately, this young man who was an indentured servant in a home is thrown in prison. And, and through slavery and through prison, the Bible continues to say that God is still with him. In circumstance after circumstance, God is with him in all of that. In the suffering, God was with him. Ultimately, without going into all the details, after 20 years of separation from his father, his family, his homeland, 20 years of festering and brewing, remembering how mistreated he had been. Somehow, in this divinely orchestrated just uh, alchemy of events, Joseph is elevated and becomes the vice president, the vice chancellor of all of Egypt. From the pit to the throne, or at least the seat beside the throne, this remarkable story that maybe Ray will tell in another message. The story does not end there, though. On that throne, through a set of circumstances, circumstances are that hard to explain, up in the promised land in Judea, where his brothers and fathers still live, a famine occurs. And 
the solution for those people in Canaan, Palestine, the solution for his brothers and fathers in their mind was to go down to Egypt because they heard that through the skillful machinations of a leader down there who happened to be their son and brother unwittingly to them, Egypt was a storehouse of food. And so those 10 brothers who 20 years before had sold Joseph into slavery, who had cruelly plotted to kill him, who had destroyed his life, at least from the outside looking in, those brothers who had deceitfully broken their father's heart by telling him his son was dead. Now they go down to Egypt and they're standing in front of Joseph. They don't know it's their brother and they're asking for food. The Bible says upon seeing these 10 men, though 20 years removed from them, Joseph recognized them, though they didn't recognize him. If you read the story between Genesis 37 and Genesis 45, it's a, it's a fascinating story. And I've told just a very cursory Reader's Digest condensed version of it, but hopefully it's enough to pique your interest and you'll go back and read it. The part of the story that's most riveting to me is that when Joseph realizes these are his brothers and he knows they don't know it's him, 20 years of hurt, 20 years of wound, unresolved woundings, 20 years of bitterness, 20 years of rolling over in that prison cell, many of those years, and thinking to himself, if I ever see them, if I ever get my hands on them, if I'm ever reunited with them, 20 years of a wound growing and untended, a wound trying to to not become septic and gangrenous, a wound that's seeking to overtake his life, a wound of hurt, of injustice. 20 years of that now culminates in this moment that he has them before him. They are prone, they are vulnerable, they're begging food from him. He can have their heads cut off now. He can reveal himself to them and say, hey guys, interesting turn here, isn't it? I am Joseph whom you persecuted. I am Joseph who you sold into slavery. What do you have to say for yourself now? 20 years. And he stands there looking at these brothers. But instead of, instead of cutting their heads off, instead of revealing himself, Joseph begins a series of events that I have long misunderstood. But that's the beauty of sacred literature. That's the beauty of these old stories. There's a power in them that I think indicates their sacredness, and that is that we can revisit them and see new layers again and again and again, not simply as they are ready to reveal themselves to us, but when the student's ready, the teacher appears, and the teacher in these stories continues to grow and move with us as our capacity expands. And in recent years, I've seen something in that story that I never saw before. Joseph looks at his brothers and ascertains through a casual conversation that they have another brother, Benjamin, Joseph's full brother with his mother, Rachel, and Jacob. He ascertains that that one younger brother had not come with the brothers, and he inquires, already insinuating in his mind, knowing why. He still inquires, and they explain the story of their father's life. They even insinuate that their father had gone through heartbreak. Joseph's sitting there listening to the story, knowing what they're saying, knowing that they have no idea that he knows what they're saying. But Joseph presses them and says, I want you to go back and I want you to bring that younger brother with you. They go home to their father and they tell him, they take the food that Joseph has sent, and they tell their father that we can't go back for more food unless we take your youngest boy with us. Jacob, still grieving, two decades later, the death of Rachel's oldest son, Joseph, a death that was not, except in his heart and mind. Jacob tells him, you can't take Benjamin. I've already lost his brother. I can't lose him. Months pass. The village was on the verge of starvation. The brothers return to their father and say, Dad, I know you don't want Benjamin to go, but if he doesn't go, not only will he die, all of us will die. 
you might as well take the risk. Jacob begrudgingly gives in, grieving as he watches Benjamin go with the brothers, saying, if you don't bring him back, my life is over. The 11 brothers now come. The Bible in Genesis 44 said they arrived, and when they arrived, and Joseph saw his younger brother Benjamin, someone he hadn't seen in 20 years since he was a little bitty toddler. Joseph sees his mother's face and Benjamin's characteristics. And Joseph has to clear the room and weep and cry. After gathering himself, he throws a feast for the brothers. The story is so stilted in ways because it's so obvious. Joseph puts more food on Benjamin's plates or has the servants put more food there than others. He gives Benjamin a prime place at the table. The brothers are wondering what's going on here. He sits the brothers in orders of their age. He's sending them clues, kind of torturous clues they can't put together. And then the story comes to a head. Joseph gives them the food, gives them the grain, and tells them they can go back to their home. One caveat, you can't take Benjamin with you. You can read the story, Joseph had set up a set of circumstances that gave him at least some legal right to look at them and say, I'm keeping the younger brother here. At that moment, having read Genesis 44 and 45, this entire set of events that I just synopsized overly quickly, at that point, for years and years and years, I read this old story through one lens, and that is a bitter man, Joseph. A bitter man, Joseph, is now torturing his brothers and putting them through a slow, torturous miserable death process to satisfy his own resentment, to satisfy his own sense of justice, and simply put, to get them back for all the pain that they had caused him. But a new look at an old story has revealed for me that's not the case at all. Because in that final moment, when Joseph looked at his brothers and said, you can't take Benjamin back with you. I'm keeping him here. Instead of the brothers looking at one another and saying, one more of Rachel's kids. We can't stand those boys anyway. We got rid of one. Here's our chance to get rid of another. Exactly what they would have done 20 years before. The indifference, the selfishness, the jealousy that they manifest 20 years before, Joseph, 20 years later, this one who had suffered at their hand, now gives them another scenario by which they can freely be rid of that younger brother, that favored younger brother, that one that they've been so jealous of. Joseph sets on a platter for them the opportunity to get rid of Benjamin. But instead of looking at one another, winking, taking their bags of grain and saying, this is a better deal than we thought it was and getting out of there, going home and telling their father that there was nothing they could do about it, but another of his favored boys is gone. Instead of doing that, the Bible said, one of the brothers speaking for all of them, step forward. And the Bible says that Judah, the fourth of the 12 boys, stepped forward and looked at Joseph, still not knowing it was his brother. He stepped forward, looked at his brother and said, we can't do that. Joseph held his line and said, well, you're going to do it or you're not going to take the bags of grain home. Doubling down on his position that Benjamin had to stay, made no impact upon the brother's resolution and resolve. Judah looked at Joseph and said, that may be the case, but we are begging you, keep us, keep every one of us, but please send him home. Joseph must have presented a curious, puzzled face because Judah went on to explain we can't tell you the whole story, Vice Chancellor, Vice Pharaoh. 
But suffice to say, this boy had another brother. And our father lost that brother a long time ago through a set of circumstances that are beyond the scope of this conversation. But Judah and all those brothers feeling responsible now stood between death, between imprisonment and their younger brother and said, keep us here. Our father has suffered enough. Oh, how freighted those words were. Our father has suffered enough. Parenthetically there, without being stated, in Judah's heart was this acknowledgement. We have hurt our father too much. We did something to a younger brother, this boy's older brother. We did something a long time ago that we can't fix, but we can regret. And the clearest indication of our regret is that if we had a chance to do it over again, we would, but we'll never have that chance to undo what we did to that brother. But we do have a chance to get it right now with this boy. The Bible says when, jo Joseph, or when Joseph faced the resolve of his brothers, he saw something there that he had not planned on seeing, but the entire ruse that he had put them through was set up at least to inquire, at least to see, at least to give opportunity for this reality. I don't know that he thought he would see it, but now he was seeing it face to face, and the reality that he was seeing was that not only in the last 20 years had the Spirit of God worked on his heart, not only in the last 20 years had he grown through the bitterness and the pain and the resentment, not only has hit, has hit had his heart been transformed. But he came face to face with something that he had not planned on. And that was on the other end, on the other end of this relationship, on the other end of this story, up in Palestine, the 10 brothers who had hurt him so deeply, they had had their own sleepless nights. They had had their own consternation and angst and struggle. They had come face to face with their own humanity, their own demons. And while Joseph was resenting and working through bitterness, they were regretting and working through repentance. And hundreds of miles apart, Spirit had been at work on both ends, perpetrator and victim. And the interesting thing is, when Joseph saw that his brothers were changed men, Genesis 45 says, Joseph cried out and told everybody in the room, get out. All the servants, all the attendants, all of his cohorts, get out, he said. Just get out. Leave me with these men. And as those men stood curious, wondering, confused, wondering what was going on, as the room cleared and they were left with this vice pharaoh of Egypt, Joseph takes off the embroidered robe, takes off the donned headdress and Joseph leans toward his brothers and says it is me Joseph the Bible said he cleared the room looked at his brothers and revealed himself to them upon revealing himself to them Joseph said I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? Upon hearing his father was alive, he wept with joy. Upon ascertaining that his father was alive, he immediately turned his attention to his brothers, who the Bible said now retreated from him, cowering, shaking in their boots, believing that finally, Justice, in their own mind, they knew justice was about to be done. The worm had turned and they were going to get what was coming to them. 
And as they huddled together, shaking with fear, Joseph's face softened. He extended his arms and he said, do not be afraid of me. Come near me. I don't know how this story applies to you. I don't know if it applies to you today. But I've told the story a hundred times to a hundred people or more. And every time I tell the story to myself, it reminds me of a few things about forgiveness. A few things about this complex matter that are so terribly true that I don't always live them well, but I know they are there for me, waiting for me at least to point myself in their direction and hopefully grow into them one day. You know, per the story of Joseph, that forgiveness is taking root, that resentment and bitterness and hatred and vitriol are experiencing the antibodies of perspective and love and growth and mercy and grace. You know that good things are happening in your soul around this complicated matter of wounds and woundings and hurts and sorrows and injustice, even those injustices perpetrated by those closest to you. You know that something good is happening in your soul. When like Joseph, not only have you wanted your life to turn out okay, that you begin to at least feel the seeds of hope that even those who have hurt you could change. Even those who've hurt you could experience transformation and that God doesn't just love one group and that's the people who've been wounded. God also with some sense of grand perspective embodied in the words from Jesus on the cross, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, that at some deep level, God is not finished even with those who have done the worst things in this life. Because maybe we haven't done that, but if we're honest, we know that we, we're not always Joseph in this story. We have at times, at least to some degree, been the older brothers. We the people talking and listening right now, we're not just coincidentally those who have always been hurt. We have also been the herders. So we've lived on both ends of this story. And what you see in the Joseph story first is that on the other side of that pain, one of the first signs of his transformation is that he begins to understand not only are there two ends of the story, but the two ends are not defined by who's an angel and who's a demon, who's wonderful and who's evil that as stratified as our minds and hearts can make this story and the two ends of the story at times as distinct and contrasting as we can make them, the two groups on either end of this story are often far closer together than what we would want to believe. As Solzhenitsyn said, I begin to realize in stories like this, the line between good and evil wasn't this thick wall built between these two disparate groups, but it was a line that goes down the middle of each of their hearts. Joseph put his brothers through hoops. This is what I wanted to say to you today, and this is a new look at an old story, but I think it's right, at least here now. Joseph put his brothers through all of those torturous hoops, not to torture them, but to make it clear for them and to become clear in his own mind that not only has his heart been transformed, but theirs had as well through the suffering. His was the suffering of being the wounded one. Theirs was the suffering of the perpetrator. Thus why Jesus would say to those who hurt him so deeply, weep not for me, weep for yourselves. That was not a snarky, sardonic thing to say. It was, it was a truth far deeper than they could even understand at the moment. When Joseph realized that his brothers were changed men, that those who so selfishly 20 years before counted his life not worth more than a few pieces of silver, 
could now stand and say, we won't do that to another brother. We won't do that to our father. When he realized they were changed men, his heart was overjoyed. You know forgiveness is working in your heart when you are happy for the transformation of those who have hurt you. And I know what it means to I know what it means to hate them so badly or to be so wounded and hurt by them that you don't want them to change. You want to stick them forever, fixing them where they were when they hurt you. You you want to give up on their capacity of soul. You want to believe that somehow they have reached the end of their evolution and the end of their evolution is one that just deserves judgment and torture forever. Somehow you even end up tacitly, if not theologically, wanting hell for them. For them to change is almost a grief to you. The transformation of soul that took place in Joseph was not only to realize that his life had still turned out good in spite of the woundings, but the transformation was to hope even that for those who had hurt him. You know forgiveness is taking root when that disposition shifts in your heart, that hope shifts in your heart. And you know forgiveness has taken place in your heart when you do what Joseph did before he revealed himself to his brothers, knowing that that was going to be a tender, vulnerable, prone moment for them, a shocking moment for them. Before revealing himself, I mean, we, we skip over this too quickly. He looked and said, everybody out. In other words, if you're not involved in this story, I don't want you here. I know when I haven't forgiven. I tell the story of my wounds to anybody who will listen. I post about it on Facebook. I want everybody to know. And I want the one who's hurt me to know that everybody knows that they've hurt me. Because love covers a multitude of sins, but hatred stirs up a matter. Joseph looked at his brothers and he looked at a bunch of other people in the room and he said, you need to get out because this isn't between you and me. And there's no need to shame them and embarrass them the correction needs to be no more broadly cast than the wound was. The wound was between me and them. The cure is going to between is going to be between me and them. Everybody out. You know forgiveness is taking root in your heart when you quit telling the story to anybody who will listen and you quit wanting everybody to know what somebody's done to you. And you know, forgiveness is taking root in your heart. The Bible said he looked at them and said, I am Joseph. And didn't immediately talk about the wound, didn't immediately talk about their story. He said, I am Joseph. Is dad still alive? You know, the work of forgiveness is happening in your heart when the wound is no longer the biggest issue to you. When you're not, you're not absorbed in the story, when you're not caught in the story, you're not in, entrenched and ensnarled in the thorns and the thistles of the story when you've been able to somehow extricate yourself and realize there's more to life than just the wound. That perspective allowed him to say, not I am Joseph. Let's talk about our story. We have a lot to talk about. It's I am Joseph. We have a lot to talk about. First things first, is dad okay? Will I get to see my dad again? You know forgiveness is taking root in your heart when the story is no longer the dominant theme of your life. And finally, when his brothers quaked and shook and cowered in fear, he saw that in their eyes. You know forgiveness is taking root in your heart when you don't want the forgiven ones, the ones who hurt you, to forever be indentured to you in fear and uncomfortable in your presence. He opened his arms and said, brothers, this is what forgiveness means. I'm not only saying I'm okay now. I want you to be okay. And neither of us ever have to be okay with what happened. We shouldn't be. But life is bigger than that now. I know at times I've said I've forgiven. But I have subconsciously enjoyed watching people be uncomfortable in my presence. Joseph's story, 3,000 years old, reminds me a pound of flesh is a pound of flesh. It's a classic story because it's not just his story, it's mine. I know forgiveness has really taken root in my heart 
when I want the story to go away. And I want not only my discomfort to be resolved, but I want theirs to be resolved. And I open my arms and I'm not talking about returning to your abuser. I'm not talking about Stockholm Syndrome. I'm not talking about trusting people who don't deserve trust. None of that. That's, that's why this is so complicated. You can't throw one story at it. I'm just talking about a general disposition of the heart that little by little grows out of the infection of resentment and bitterness and wants the pain on whichever end of the story it exists, just wants the pain to be done. There's so much more to tell about this story, but I've told enough today. And I think I've tried to do what Ray is doing in this series and I think is a really lovely thing to do. And that's to remind ourselves these stories that we grew up with, they may, me, they may mean more than we knew. I think they do. I think they still have some tread on the tire, a lot of tread on the tire actually. And I hope this story helps you guys as being both those who have hurt and those who have been hurt. Maybe it gives us all some wisdom to take away and live better lives and relieve suffering and elevate joy and just simply be good to one another. All right, I love you, Village. I'll see you soon. Thanks for opening your hearts and taking a new look at an old story. We'll see you guys. are three ways you can give to support the love focused culture changing ever evolving community building jesus inspired work of the village church you can text the word give to 404-998-8979 you can give online at thevillageatlanta.com or you can send a check to the village church 3418 dogwood drive hateville georgia 30354 have a great week.